All right, we're in the series. Actually, that's perfect, because we're in the series mixtape. Anybody know what a mixtape is? All right, so a mixtape is whenever you had one of these sitting in your room, and you decided that you, this, was, this is, today they call them playlists and their drag and drop downloads. But back then we had to work for our playlists. <laughs> and uh, you'd put one tape in one deck and then another tape in another deck and, and you would line up the song that you were ready to play. And if you had a fancy tape deck, then, then you could get it all set up and just hit unpause and they'd both start spinning at the same time. But if you weren't that wealthy, then uh, then you didn't have the unpause and you just had to click them both at the same time as best you could. And, and you know that if you didn't hit it right, then the, the, the beginning of your song would go like that. And you know what I'm talking about? Or, or maybe if you were recording off the radio, you hope that your song that you were looking for would come in after a commercial because typically they would announce it and say, oh, all right, when we come back from this commercial break, we're gonna be playing whatever the song was. And you'd be like, all right, so you get all ready and you'd be waiting for all 73,506 commercials. And as soon as that last one you thought played, you'd, you'd do this, you know? And, and in between the songs, there wasn't any kind of standardization. You could have a three minute, a three second break, or you could have a 40 second break, or one song could just roll right into the next song. And, and that's how it was. But the reason you did mixtapes is because my mixtapes were all about wanting to listen to certain things in my car. And so I would, I would make a mixtape and I'd put it in my car and all my favorite songs would then play. But most people, when they did mixtapes, it was to show their great admiration and love for someone. And so they would, they would put all of their feelings together um, by different artists and, and different bands and stuff like that and different songs. They put all of their feelings together and they'd, sometimes they'd go hand it to somebody who didn't even know that they existed in order <laughs> to try to tell them about the deep, abiding, lifelong, never gonna end love that they had for them in that moment until next week and somebody else got a mixtape. But anyway, they, uh, but that's, that was kind of the idea behind the mixtape that, that you would put all of this time and devotion into putting just the right mix of songs together to share with somebody you loved. And I'm gonna tell you this, I love you. And I believe that you love me, even if you don't want to, you do. I'm just gonna believe it in faith, you do. And, and we, our team has put together a, a series of, of sermons here. It won't all be the same person speaking, different messages, different people, and, but all working together for the encouragement and for the betterment of our faith family. We are, we are moving forward together. And so I'm looking forward to mixtape and uh, it's gonna be a good series, I encourage you to be here. Today, I wanna to talk to you about what it means to have a power shift in your life, a power shift. We're gonna start off with our big idea. The big idea is you live with the power of Christ in your life. You live with the power of Christ in your life. He's there, he's in you. If you are a believer today, it's Christ in you that is your hope of glory. If you're a believer today, the Holy Spirit is empowering your life. Think about all that was expressed through the life of Christ. It was a lot. It was a lot of power in the life of Christ. And you might rightly say, I'm not Christ. I've checked, and that's not me. And I would agree that it isn't you, nor is it me, but here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. So the Spirit of God that did the miracle of raising Jesus from the dead lives in you. You, me, the believers. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. Now, he's talking about the resurrection from the dead. 
He's talking about how when Jesus Christ returns, the Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then those which are alive and remain will be caught up together. Okay, it's the commonly referred to rapture, although the scripture doesn't use that term, rapture specifically, the catching away, if you will. But he, this is what he's talking about. He's saying even if you die, God has the ability to raise you up just like he raised up Christ. All right, but he's saying that that spirit lives in you. He's not saying that spirit will live within you. He's not saying that that spirit at some point will work upon you. He said that same spirit is within you, present tense. And then he also writes in Ephesians 1, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. It's the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand. The same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Father, okay? That's the power that lives in you. Then he goes on in verse 21, now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. So he's telling us very clearly that the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives within the believer present tense. Are you, if you're a believer, raise your hand. Okay, so that's you, that's me. If you're a believer, then the, that same power that lived in Christ, that raised Christ from the dead, lives in you, present tense. And then he says that that power is not only for the next world, but it's also in this present world. He says it in reverse, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. So he's telling us that that power is within us and that power will work within us regardless of our situation, our circumstance, our issue, our condition. The power of God works in the life of the believer. And so ultimately we know and we understand and we see and it's obvious that believers are powerful. Powerful. If you're a believer, you are powerful, but it does not always seem like it. There are times when it does not seem like you're powerful at all. Sometimes the world presses against you, pushes against you. Situations push and press against you to the point where you just feel crowded and, and you feel weak, you feel powerless, you feel like you cannot do anything about the situation that you're in and you need a power shift in your life. And that's what I want to talk about, this power shift. Jesus gave us an example of a power shift in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's in the garden. He's praying to the Father. In fact, John chapter 17 is where we were last, last month talking about the prayer that he prayed. God, Father, let them be one even as we are one. But now we're in John 18 and, and he has this incredible moment of, of intimacy and, and wonder with the Father. He says things like, not my will, but thy will be done. And, and everything seems to come together. And, and man, he's at peace and he's ready to do what needs to be done. And then, and then... He's still pressed. There, there's, there's a season here where he's stressed, he's stretched, he's strained. The friends came with him. It's nice to have friends. They came with him, but they were sleeping. They theoretically understood what was going on, but they didn't feel what he was feeling. They didn't know exactly what was happening there. And when he seemed to make peace with the moment, the moment shifted. He says, not my will, but thine be done. He gets up. He's ready to roll. He's feeling good. Ooh, I got this. I don't know if Jesus did that, but <laughs> I got this. I can, ooh. <clears throat> and then the sound of soldiers filled the garden. Have you ever been at peace with something and then just one or two things shifted and it seemed like you were going, hey, peace, peace, peace. Where, where, where'd that go? Where, where suddenly you can't seem to get a hold of it? I don't think that was Jesus at all. He, he's at peace now, but now the soldiers are filling the garden to arrest him, and they are in control. By every 
logical way of looking at this, the soldiers are controlling the situation. They have political control because they're the Roman soldiers. Rome is ruling the territory and, and the Romans are enforcing their, their rule, their law, their ways upon the people. And so if the Roman soldiers are coming to get you, you got. They're in control. Politically, economically, they, they're running the economy of the world. Rome is. Socially, they can impress their society on anyone that they want to because they have all the power. Numerically, there's one Jesus and there's a bunch of soldiers. So they're in control in every way except, yes, even relationally. Because while the Roman soldiers may not have known who Jesus was, and he might be able to say, hey, who are you looking for? And they say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he goes, yeah, my name's Bob. How are you doing? Um, I don't know where Jesus is at all. He was just here. He could have done that maybe potentially to the Roman soldiers, but he could not have done that to Judas, his friend who was leading the soldiers to him. There was no way for him to get out of that. They're arresting Jesus and there seems to be nothing he can do about it. And maybe you can relate. Maybe you can relate in your own world that you've reached your limit, but the world isn't quite done with you yet. Maybe in your life it's, it's COVID and, and issues dealing with it. Maybe it's economic issues that are relating from it or other things. You know, everything in the world isn't directly COVID related, though it seems like it is at times. There's other things going on economic. How about societally? There, there are situations going on in culture and society that just are putting stress and strain on different things and, and how you interact with people that maybe you've interacted with them your whole life, but all of a sudden it seems like things are more pressurized than they've been before. Maybe it's not society at all. Maybe it's in your own home and your family within the four walls of your house. And things are stressed and strained and, and you've reached your limit. You might have good friends that are walking with you, but just because they're your friends doesn't mean, don't, doesn't mean that they can always relate exactly to what's going on in your world. And in this moment, you might feel logically disadvantaged. And listen, it's easy if you don't have a lot or if you think you don't have a lot to say, well, if I just had more of this or just had more of that or, or if that was right in my life, then everything would be okay. It doesn't matter where you are on any, on any measure of status. The fact of the matter is that everybody feels down sometime. Everybody is overwhelmed at some time. And everybody needs a power shift to occur in their life at some point. So Jesus hears the soldiers coming and, and, and he doesn't shrink away. In fact, Jesus knowing that all would happen to him. So he didn't walk into this not understanding what was going on. In John 18 verse 4 it says, Jesus knowing all that would happen to him came forward and said to them, whom do you seek? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So here are a bunch of Roman soldiers looking at one Jesus. And Jesus says, I am he. And bam, they fall to the ground. Power shifts in that moment. Prior to that, they were absolutely in control. I cannot imagine that they felt threatened in any way whatsoever. They're walking in with swords. They're walking in with numbers. They're walking in with all the temporal authority that, they could, that could be mustered. And they're standing in front of one guy who is in a small region, in, a, in an insignificant place in all reality in the Roman world. And they're standing there and they're about to take him into custody and there's nothing he can do. And yet he says three words and they're on the ground. Can I tell it to you this way? God is always the most powerful player in the situation. There is never a moment in which God is not the most powerful player. He is always the one that is in control. He is the almighty God. And God's identity defines his authority. When he declares something to be, it becomes. He is one who shifts the power dynamic in any moment 
when he's engaged, when he's involved, and he has a long history of working through people. Think about all the way back in the Old Testament when you have this guy named Moses that, that he's, he's, he's born to a Jewish mother, but he's raised by a Pharaoh's daughter in the palace. And, and then years later, he understands who he is. He sees uh, injustice being done. And so he strikes out. But in his striking out, he aligns himself with the people of God. And, and, and now he's, he's not in alignment with Pharaoh anymore. And suddenly he's running for his life. And now he's in the backside of the desert, which is a bad place to be. And he's in the backside of the desert. He's, a, he's now a shepherd instead of a prince. And, and, and he's, he, he's trying to figure out what to do. And God, in fact, he thinks he's escaped the situation. He's got a wife now. He's got a family now. Things are going good. He's building a life for himself way back over here. But God appears to him in a burning bush and says, listen, dude, I'm not done with you yet. The Hebrew of dude, I don't know. The, uh, but he says, I'm not done with you yet. And Moses is trying to figure out, all right, so here's, the, here's, a, here's a couple issues that I have, God, with your plan um, and me. Uh, and, so, and so, number one, I can't talk really well. Number two, who do I say when I look at Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the known world at the time, do I, who do I say is sending me on this mission? whose authority am I working within? And God speaks to Moses and says in Exodus 3, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So the I am God, the one who is what needs, he needs to be in this very moment, the God who's not going to be or was, but the one who is present tense in this moment, in this situation, in this circumstance, he's the one who is working in you and through you, Moses. And when Pharaoh asks who sends you, say the God who's right here right now and who, who can be anything he needs to be in order to get the job done, that's the one that sent me to you right now, Pharaoh. The I am has sent me to you. And that declaration still changes everything today. The I am God is the one that raised Jesus from the dead. The I am God is the one who dwells within you. The I am God has not stopped being the I am. He remains the I am. And he remains the I am God in your life today. In fact, he spoke through Moses. He is who Jesus claimed to be. And he lives in you. And you and I accepting that and working within that reality is what causes a power shift to occur in our lives. It allows us to experience a power shift, whether it be on our job or in, in our company that we own or, or run or manage or, or in our family or in our relationships or in our finances or wherever it may be, understanding who is within us, who we are and whose we are makes a big difference in, in the power dynamic that we're operating within. And I have two thoughts for us today, and I cannot promise you that I'll stay with my notes, but I can promise you that I will give you two blanks to fill in, okay? <laughs> Thought number one is this. Private devotion results in public expression. Private devotion results in public expression. Devotion is this thing that, that, that it's the love, it's the loyalty, it's the enthusiasm for someone or something. That's what devotion means. It means that we love them, that we're excited about them, that, that, we, that we're loyal to them, to them or to that cause, whatever it may, may be. But in Christianity, we often say devotion as in at 6.30 every morning, I sit down with my Bible and my pen and my journal and I read the Bible, I say hello and good morning to Jesus and then I write some stuff down in my journal. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. If you know anything about Five Lakes Church, we encourage that every single day in our life Bible reading plan and our journaling plan and, and so on. I love it. I love it. But that's not all of devotion. It's just one expression of devotion. We call it devotion. But devotion really is a, a, a consistent honoring of something, a consistent connection to something. It's not saying, okay, I'm devoted to my wife, and, and so on Tuesdays at 6.30, I say hello to her. We talk for a minute, I write some things down, and then I'll see you next Tuesday at 6.30. No, that's not how that works. 
or I'd be a single man. That's what would be in my devotional right there. You are single. Um, no, devotion means more than just a particular moment. It, it means a life, a lifestyle. It means how we de de make decisions and, and determine our actions and move into our futures. In fact, public expression always follows private devotion. It always follows private devotion. Think about those people who have publicly expressed certain things, politically or, or in faith, religiously, uh, declared themselves to be something that later on we all discovered that they weren't what they said they were. What you found out is that their private devotion did not match or align with their public expression. We would like it if our private devotion followed our public expression. I am thin, I do not like cake, I hate ice cream. That may be my public expression. But my private devotion to cake and ice cream will actually be the thing that is eventually publicly expressed. <laughs> it doesn't go the other direction. I, I, in our world, we, they, they say, fake it till you make it. Think like where you want to go. Dress like where you want to go. You know, drive like where you want to go. Speak like where you want to go. And, and I agree with the thinking like where you want to go and speaking like where you want to go. I completely agree with that. But driving like where you want to go, if, 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 if it fits your budget, drive like where you want to go. But if your budget says Hyundai and you're where you want to go says Mercedes, point your bicycle to the Hyundai dealership, okay? <laughs> because, because you're going to find yourself in deficit consistently. People say, dress like where you want to go. Well, if, if your budget says Target, but where you want to go says Nordstrom's, drive to Target. Don't go to Nordstrom's. If you'll drive to Target long enough and maintain your uh, stewardship properly, then you'll end up being able to drive to Nordstrom's without trying to worry about how you're going to pay for where you're going. Amen to that. So what happens and why this is difficult is because private devotion doesn't instantly show up in public expression. So if I eat an entire cheesecake tonight, tomorrow my pant size won't change. But eventually, y'all will say, huh, his private devotion is different than his public expression. Because now, after several months of this, he is expressing publicly what he is actually doing privately. And that's what we find in a politician that fails, a religious leader that fails, in a business leader that fails, in every person that ends up not, not living out what they declare themselves to be, what's happened in his public expression is is following there. So you're worried about what everybody thinks about you and what actually is, what you should be worried about is what you're doing when no one's looking at you. I am, I am more dedicated to Christy, not when I'm standing in front of Christy, but by my actions, my attitudes, and my comportment when I'm not in front of her, when she's not in the room and she would never, ever know. Until my public expression aligned with my private devotion. And then she would know. Private devotion results in public expression. Jesus ended and, well, started and ended his ministry in private places. In the beginning, he was in the wilderness. He was privately tested in the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. And he was faithful in his private devotion. And that became public miracles. Disciples developed an unmatched impact made in the world. He ended his ministry in the same way, private testing. In the garden, 
stressed and strained and so overwhelmed that it was like he was sweating blood. And, and yet he's privately faithful. And so he is publicly, publicly tied, publicly tried, publicly beaten, publicly crowned with thorns, and publicly nailed to a cross. He's publicly pierced with a spear. He publicly dies. And he publicly goes to the grave. And so one might think, well, why on earth would I want to be privately devoted to something that's going to publicly result in all of those things? Now, I like the public expression of miracles and disciples and, and expansion of influence. I love all that part. But, 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 but woo. Why would I want to be privately devoted can I cut a deal on the side? Can I, can I do something different that will cause the public expression of my private devotion to be something different? How about we work it out some other way? That's what Jesus was doing when he said, if there's another way, Lord. If there's another way, Father. But when the Father didn't say, yeah, there's another way, he said, but not my will, thine be done. And he, and he publicly went through with the Father's plan. And everybody thought he lost until the third day. Because on the third day, yes, he, yes, he was tied. Yes, he was tried. Yes, he was beaten. Yes, he was crowned. And yes, he was nailed to a cross where he died. But on the third day, he rose. And he rose in power and authority. He rose in a power and authority that could not be matched by anything this earth had to offer. He rose in power and authority in such a way as that where he would never go down again. He rose in power and authority in such a way as to where right now he sits at the right hand of the Father and he was able to say all power is in heaven and earth belongs to me. It's been given to me by my father, by your father. That's where he sits right now. Yes, yes, for a moment, the private devotion led to a difficult public expression, but it, it ended in absolute total authority being given over to him. I would say the three days were worth it. <laughs> Praise God. But more importantly, I'd say those three days were worth it for you and me. Because when he went through all of that, he, he, he was able to give you and I a power and authority that was beyond this world. And that's why Paul could write that that same power lived in you and lives in me. And so my encouragement today is reveal God's power through your life by aligning your private devotion with your public expression. You say, well, my public expression isn't good. Then repent. You say, well, my private devotion isn't good. Then repent. What repentance is, is saying, I'm, I'm off. I know I'm off. I'm sorry that I'm off and I'm going to get it right. And by getting it right with him, his forgiveness flowing in our life, now we're able to walk and stand with power. And suddenly we become a clear conduit for God's power to work in us. The power is there. It's just like you take a water hose. Do y'all say a water hose? Do we say hose? Okay. My father says hose pipe. I don't, I, even I can't explain that. Okay, so. But you take a water hose and everything's flowing freely and then you kink it. That's what happens when our private devotion isn't aligned with our public expression. It's just a little off. And now, is the Holy Spirit there? Yes. Do you lose your salvation if those things are off? No. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking heaven and hell. I'm talking about a better life. And, and, and when suddenly those things are aligned now, it's boom. Now, if you've never repented and allowed Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, then I am talking about heaven or hell. But if, but if you're a believer today and, and your private devotion has gotten off, you're still saying the right things publicly, but privately you know you're way off, then, then repentance is unkinking that hose in your life. And letting the Holy Spirit begin to work through you. Secondly, so first is repentance. Secondly, it's obedience. Submitting to his will and his word. And third is worship. Allowing him to be lifted up and magnified in your life on a regular basis while you submit yourself to him and you recognize who he is versus who you are. Praise God. And that brings us to thought number two, that live in the power you have, not from the power you desire. 
Live in the power you have, not from the power you desire. Jesus knew who he was and he knew who he would be. He knew that where he was standing and he knew that one day he would sit at the, at the right hand of the Father in all power and all authority. And yet when they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, he didn't say, I will be who I will be. He didn't say, I will become who I shall become. He didn't say, someday, let me tell you a story about how it's going to be in my life. He said, I am he. He was operating from the power that he had in his life. He knew what his destiny was, but he also understood what his reality was. His destiny was as the one sitting in all power and all authority at the right hand of the Father. His reality was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And bef before he could be the one at the right hand, he had to be the one on the cross. He had to be the lamb before he could be the champion. And so you find Jesus saying, not my will. He's operating his, in the authority that he has. You can only experience a power shift based on what's in your hand. You can use it different ways. You can operate it with it different ways. But you can only use, experience a power shift based on what is in your hand. It's got to be something that you have. If only... And when I attitudes are the enemies of your power shift. When people start saying, well, if I only had. Or when I have. What, what we're doing is we're, we're negating the power shift that, that can occur right now. Recognize the authority and the power that you hold in your hand. In, within your heart, within your spirit. The power of God in operation within you right now, today. Jesus could have said, all power and authority will be given to me, so back off. But he didn't. He said, I am he. I am he. And that led him through a process. Christy is a, a professional web developer, my wife. She does the website for our church. She's not really happy that I'm telling you that right now. She's really good. And she did every, all the media stuff for the church down in Houston before we came here. She's really good at it, but she didn't start there. When Christy first started building websites, it's because we were in Chicago planting a church and we're trying to get the word out around the city that there was a new church in town that maybe they should consider visiting. And so... We went to the radio station in town, and uh, it was a Christian radio station, and we met with them because we're Christians and they're Christians, and we thought, you know, Christians are nice to Christians. And they said, is your budget $10,000 a month or more? I said, we make $800 a month and no more, so no. And they said, well, we can't really talk to you until your budget's at least 10000 a month. So we walked out of there feeling a little bit less than. We got in the car, driving home, and Christy said, you know, I think I might be able to learn how to build a website. And so we stopped at the, at the store, and we got websites for dummies or something like that. <laughs> and she started figuring out how to build a website, and her first website was built in Word. Not only is it a Windows product, which you have to forgive us for that, but number two, that's a joke, sorry. The, uh, <laughs> that's not what you build websites in. But that's what she built her website in. And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't her best website ever. And it took her a long time to build it as she learned. But it was effective. We didn't have a lot, but we used what was in our hand. And suddenly people started showing up to the church saying, well, I saw you online. You did? <laughs> and then Christy was like, oh, you did? <laughs> but we started with what was in our hand. Now today she works on a powerful computer and, and she's using all Adobe products and she's, she knows how to make it happen and she can make it happen relatively fast and she, and she keeps everything moving. She's an expert in this area of, of industry and, and she's amazing, 
but she did not wait to be amazing before she became effective. Could it be that there are some people in this room right now that you keep waiting for your power level to be here, but you're not using the power level that's here? You, you, you keep waiting for a million dollars, but you won't manage a hundred dollars. You, you keep waiting for the best relationship of your life whenever you won't manage the relationship that you have now. You keep dreaming about the day when you can speak to a mountain and it will be fall, it'll go into the sea, but you don't use the faith that God's given you to operate with today. You keep waiting for that thing to happen to, to where all of your problems will be, will be gone, but you don't use the authority that you have in the problem right now. And it could be because you're looking at it and saying, well, if I do that, there's still going to be pain. Yes, there will still be pain in your life, even with authority, if you're working for the bigger picture. Jesus is the most powerful man to ever walk the earth. He has a direct link with the Father. He is God made flesh. He is the Son of God. And yet, he was not exempt from all pain. Jesus is, is, is the one who the scripture says could call down a legion of angels and they would have released him from the cross and yet he doesn't do that when he could because he had a bigger purpose in mind. And when he went through all the, the drama and the trauma, God raised him from the dead on the other end and so what I'm saying to you is this. Your situation may look really dire right now, but the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. Your, your resource may seem to be really lacking right now, but the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. The relationship may just be holding on by a thread, but the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. Your business may seem to be failing, but the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. Your relationship with Christ may seem a little faltered, but the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. So all I'm asking you, all I'm encouraging you, you and me both to do is let's use the power that's within us. Yes, we might face a problem, but if God will allow us to face the problem, he'll take us through the problem. If he doesn't take me out of it, it means he's going to take us through it. And at the other side, we're going to be better off than before. I believe that. Praise the name of the Lord. I believe it because the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. Lives in you. Don't spend more time hiding from the issue than you do addressing it. You're scary, Pastor David. <laughs> Apparently that's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you're scary. You're a big problem. You're an issue in life. And so, it's, it's normal for me to try to shield myself from you instead of using the authority or the power that God's given me to address you. But, Jesus did not wait to be captured. He stepped forward. The moment he stepped forward and said, I am he, the power shifted. And the ones who had been in power fell to the ground. Now, Jesus still went, he was still bound. Because he chose that. He still went to be tried but he had not lost any power. He was still whipped, no loss of power. He was still crowned with thorns, no loss of power. He was nailed to the cross, no loss of power. He died, power remains. Stabbed in the side, blood and water flow, no loss of power. He's taken to the cave, the tomb and it's in the tomb when all power seemed to be gone that he descends into Hades and he takes from the enemy the keys to death hell and the grave he takes total authority right there and it is from that place of total what seems to be weakness 
in the eyes of the world that he rises to ultimate power. I don't know what you're going through right now. I, I don't know what your situation you're facing and I don't know what press you're feeling. All I'm saying is don't forget that there's power in you. And when you say, I am he, I am a child of God. I am a son. I am a daughter of the king. I, I am one who is favored by the Lord. I am one who's empowered by the Holy Spirit. I am one who can walk through the battle of the valley of the shadow of death and I will fear no evil because God is with me. I am the one. I am one of his. When we are able to say that suddenly, yes, we will walk through trial, but we will walk with head high. Yes, there will be a battle, but we will not become tired. Yes, there will be difficulty that we will face but God will see us through why because a power shift occurs and now maybe it looks like I'm down but I still am powerful even in this moment why not because of who I am but because the power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you and he lives in me and I say thank you Jesus for that today praise the name of the Lord Praise God, praise God, praise God. So Lord God, we don't, we don't, I don't know what everybody's dealing with, but you do. And your power doesn't shift, your power doesn't change, your power does not wane based upon the circumstance that we're in. No, your power remains all power and authority. So I pray that we would align our, in, our private devotion with our external expression to open up the conduit of our lives and allow your power to flow through us. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give us the ability, to the, the courage to operate within the power that we have, trusting that you're gonna give us the power that we need. Even what I, when, I, when, when what I need, I cannot see. You are the God of all things and you do all things well. So use us for your glory today. Work on our behalf. Let us stand strong, head high, shoulders squared, knowing that you are God and that you live in us. In Jesus' name we pray. And let everybody say amen. Amen. Prayer partners, come forward. Let's stand together. If you need prayer, come forward and let us pray with you. In Jesus' name, let's close this service with worship.